Okay, class, so welcome back to our final part of our pediatric cardiology uh, unit. So uh, we're getting to the medical and surgical and rehab management for these cases um, and conditions. So this is a plot of the age of death rate due to uh, congenital heart defects. So as you can see, we've gotten better um, over time in managing and treating these cases, um, you know, while now, this is the case. There's definitely still some um, potential uh, disparities between different uh, ethnic groups. So we have a plot here. Uh, this is uh, data looking at trends in infant mortality compared to uh, black and white uh, kids. Um, so while both groups have had significant reductions in mortality, uh, there still is a pretty significant disparity um, between what we see between white white kids and and and, um, and black kids, so uh, definitely still something to address. The social determinants of health uh, still manifest in in this this as well. And we, again, we think this may be access to prenatal care, education, and even just access to um, uh, you know the, to the healthcare facilities. And then looking at the types of defects, so of course the the more significant the defect. Um, you know, the higher the risk of mortality. Um, as we have differences here, obviously, between looking at, you know, an aortic coarctation or ASD, kind of on the lower end, and when looking up at transposition of the great vessel. So again, the, the more severe the heart defect, the higher uh, the likelihood of mortality, the prognosis is improving. And, you know, arguably, uh, kind of what we see here, you know, if we look at uh, the death rate due to congenital heart defects, most of it happens really within that first year of, of life. Um, we'll kind of get into that as well. Most surgeries themselves are performed within the first two years of life, and we'll get to maybe why that, that's the case. Um, but typically, if a kid gets to about five years old-ish, like the, their likelihood of, of making it, right, is pretty good, right? So again, usually that, that first year of life is probably the most crucial part. It's when the bulk of the surgeries are done, the first one or two years. And if, if they get to about age five, you know, their, their, their trends kind of level off in terms of mortality risk. And then looking at medical management, right? So surgical intervention is going to be the biggest thing if it's something that requires a correction, right? Um, if it's a noticeable structural defect. Uh, some defects require multiple surgeries. We'll go over the one for uh, hypoplastic left, left heart syndrome. There's, I believe, a th three-stage procedure. And then, um, again, with the advent of uh, technology, technological and surgical advances, um, you know, the mortality rates have decreased. But again, there's still morbidity and disability because, again, the kid's going to be stuck in the, in the NICU, maybe stuck in the hospital. You know, while the kid may survive, that's going to have significant impacts on their development, neurocognitively, and just their, you know, their ability to move, right? And again, kids learn from moving. Um, so, uh, we'll just touch on this. We'll get into this later on, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, this is used quite often to help stabilize kids, um, you know, uh, post, post surgery. So, or pre, pre operatively to surgery. Um, we see this often in kids, uh, with more significant lesions. You'll see this also when we get into our cardiac surgery and ICU lectures. We're not gonna spend too much time on it, but basically it's a, it's a machine that will allow you to support the cardiac and respiratory systems for prolonged periods of time. So you can think of it almost analogous as a souped up bypass machine that can be used for, for, for days versus, you know, we typically use a bypass at most really for 45 minutes within the surgery. So, um, so the procedure we'll talk about is one that's used for uh, hypoplastic uh, left heart syndrome. So there's, again, there's, a, there's stages to it. So this is done within the first two weeks of life, right? So the surgeons create a new aorta and connect it to the right ventricle, right? So um, this is done using the pulmonary root, the ascending aorta, and uh, some homograph tissue. So what you'll see here is what they'll do. Again, they'll remove some of the aorta from this hypoplastic left side. They'll attach it to the right side. And then they will add this bilock uh, tussing shunt from the aorta, right, from one of the aortic branches to the pulmonary artery. So now there is still return, right, of uh, 
pulmonary veins into the left atrium, but moving across uh, the freight, you know, a, a, an ASD of some kind, or some sort of opening here. And uh, you're still pumping out, th you know, from the right ventricle, you're still getting inputs from the vena cava. So there's mixed blood that's going out now through this kind of mocked up uh, aortic root um, that is connected to the pulmonary artery through this shunt. So uh, now the right ventricle is doing kind of all of the work. There's mixed oxygen, you know, mixed blood basically, because you've got all the deoxygenated blood or low oxygenated blood coming back into the right side. You still have the left side coming through this uh, ASD mixing. Again, we typically try to keep some of these defects uh, around. Um, but it's allowing the kids still to get some perfusion out, right? It's going to be mixed, right? They're going to have a little bit of deoxygenated, a little bit of high oxygenated blood there, but they're, they'll at least be able to get some, uh, some blood flow out to the body, right? Because, you know, there's no left ventricle here. So it's connected by the shunt, aorta, um, we removed, connected to the right ventricle, connect the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. And then the next procedure is the bidirectional Glenn uh, shunt. So this is usually performed at four to six months, and it creates a direct connection between the pulmonary artery and the superior vena cava, right? So we've got, you know, a shunt now directly going um, to, the, to the pulmonary artery. So now this helps offload some of the work um, that the right ventricle has to do, so we don't have as much volume going on. Um, going back into one side. Um, it's still doing some of the work because we still have that other shunt, but at least now it's, it's just a little bit easier um, on that right ventricle, right? So there's still mixing of blood, but it's offloading some of the work because now we're, we're, we're connecting the superior vena cava directly to the pulmonary artery. We're getting past the flow into the lungs. And then there is the Fontaine procedure, which is a final part of this, right? So this is done after about a year and a half or three years, and now the surgeons will connect the... Um, the, vena, uh, the inferior vena cava directly, and this is actually coded wrong, this would be inferior vena cava, right, directly to the pulmonary artery. So now you've got passive flow completely going to the pulmonary arteries. We'll remove uh, the previous shunt um, that was connecting the aorta to the pulmonary artery, and now the, the right ventricle is a single pump, right, single pump, um, right, single ventricle, uh, but it's now only working against you know, only supplying the left side. The, the right side, right, is completely passive filled, the pulmonic circuit, by these shunts going right to the pulmonary artery and at the lungs. Pulmonary veins are still there, bringing blood flow back. It's going to cross across that ASD, and the right ventricle will, now will pump it out to the aorta. So this is, again, just to give an example of the stages of surgeries. Kids will go through multiple surgeries um, throughout their life um, in staged manners, you may even see sometimes like kids will have, uh, you know, when they're going through these different procedures, have a more, have a different acceptable range of pulse oximetry, realizing that they're going to get some mixing of blood. So just be mindful of that if you're working with a kid in the pediatric NICU, that like their acceptable range for oxygenation may be a little bit different. And again, just think of this, like you're going to be in the hospital probably, you know, by the time you're three years old or even a year and a half, you, this kid may have had three pretty major surgeries. So just, again, think of how that, how that affects development, how that affects the musculoskeletal system, how that affects just kind of everything for this kid. So even though they may not have, you know, an, an acquired, you know, a, um, a congenital neurocognitive uh, delay or disability, just by nature of them having these many procedures, being in the hospital this long during that first year to two years, like they're going to be a little bit behind. Right? So just bear that in mind. Um, and then with this Fontaine procedure, these kids will probably still need to get a heart transplant because, again, the right ventricle, you know, it's really not designed to, to work against the, uh, the forces that are in the aorta. So this is enough to kind of get kids uh, to survive, but they may end up needing a heart transplant. Um, this is an example, again, of the atrial switch, arterial switch uh, procedure for people who are kids who have transposition of the great uh, great. Uh, vessels. So talk about that procedure there. So we can see we're just switching basically uh, the placements of the aorta and pul uh, pulmonary artery, which in this condition is incorrectly um, positioned. So we're just switching and switching them back. Again, pediatric heart transplant. Um, so 10% of cases are uncorrectable. Um, so we, you know, even if we 
wanted to do surgery, it's just not going to work. Probably the most common cause uh, or common case or condition that would result in a transplant would be uh, the hypoplastic life, left heart syndrome. Again, there is multiple procedures, procedures and surgeries that these kids will often have before they get to that stage to keep them alive as long as they can to keep them transplanted. Because um, as you'll soon will learn in our transplant lecture, like there just aren't enough organs to go around, even for kids. Um, the great thing is like if the transplant's done early enough, sometimes like the, the heart will kind of adapt and grow as a child develops. Um, and most kids get about, you know, 20 years after heart transplant. Um, and, and the majority get at least five years, right? So um, it, it's been shown that it can give kids a pretty no, fairly normal life like the graft, if the graft survives, um, but it, it may not last a normal lifespan, right? Again, depending on when the surgery is done. Um, so some kids do get retransplanted. So again, just think of, again, while these kids, you know, may not have had, you know, and, you know, an, you know, uh, you know, a genetic, you know, cause, right, of a neurocognitive decline or developmental disability, like having these many surgeries this earlier in development is going to have, going to have some ramifications on, on motor development and, and cognitive development. So again, you know, we, you know, this is, the outcomes are generally pretty good if kids can get get to this. Um, if it's done early enough, sometimes uh, the heart I itself will, will uh, accommodate. A large number of uh, of recipients will need to be retransplanted at, at some point um, uh, in their life. And this just gives you an example of kind of the survivorship uh, following uh, pediatric heart transplant uh, before age 21. As you can see, the vast majority of people at least get five years um, and then some outcomes are as, as good as 20 years. Yes, and, and some outcomes are as good as 20 years. Um, and this is just an example of the treatment algorithms for neonates and infants with critical uh, left ventricular alpha tract obstructions and just the different types of things that may be done. Um, again, this is just something to be mindful of um, if you're working in this population. Now, probably the most important thing, again, this is not a uh, pediatric, you know, pediatric specialty course to cover this. Um, really, the, the biggest thing for physical therapists, you know, we're going to be assessing, you know, breathing, respiratory rate. The kids may have higher edema. Um, they may have impaired tolerance to activity. Even after the surgery, again, like we're, we're making shunts, we're making, you know, bypasses, you know, to allow the heart to function, but, you know, it's still got some, you know, some potential inefficiencies. So just working with these kids, trying to build up their endurance, working on positioning, educating the parents are going to be really, really big um, uh, components. As well as, you know, there are different scales too. So um, one of the toughest things when working with pediatrics, especially in neonates, um, is that they can't talk. So you can't get that great of a feedback sometimes of how well they're tolerating a uh, treatment session. Um, so we have this thing called the NIPS or neonatal infant pain uh, scale, um, which is recommended for kids less than one years of age just before kids, or really any child before they're able to, to verbalize and, and communicate. Um, so it's it comprises six different indicators uh, or behavioral indicators related to pain um, or discomfort. So their facial expression, are they crying? What's their breathing pattern? Is it relaxed or they have a change in breathing? Um, and realistically, any, any score higher than three indicates the kid is in some sort of pain or discomfort. So just to use this as monitoring if you're working with a, with a child who can't communicate. And again, uh, the, the biggest thing for us you know, in, in pediatrics for really anything is, um, you know, educating the, the family, right? You know, I mean, realistically, the, 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 you know, we can spend two hours each day working with the, uh, the patient, you know, you know, but realistically that the parents are going to be working with these kids for the rest of their lives. So you know, when you're working with a pediatric patient, you're, you're, you're treating the whole family, educating them and realizing that like it's, it, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a, a stressful thing for them and just being mindful of that um, in our interactions. But you know, the same thing is like, you know, that we would do with an adult po you know, population, try to prevent complications so that, you know, often is pulmonary issues. So repositioning the, uh, the, you know, the child to prevent secretion buildup in the lungs, teaching them some passive range of motion, or, you know, positioning as, as tolerated, activity as tolerated, there may be some restrictions, just being able to educate that to the, to the, to the patients. And then remembering that there may be some um, cutoffs that are a little bit different 
um, depending on the case. Like there, there is some evidence that an SpO2 um, range between 85 and 93 percent might be actually sufficient for for pediatric patients. So um, you know, always be mindful of that. You know, hyperoxia can be can be problematic for kids. Um, we think it may have issue, may have, may affect the retinas, may also affect other tissues. Remembering oxygen is a pretty volatile um, substance, so don't just ever go into a room and willy nilly increase the oxygen. Make sure you understand uh, what's the acceptable parameters for that patient, um, just so that you know we're we're making sure that they're the, we're giving them the best opportunity to be successful um, you know, following surgery as they can. But uh, pediatrics, you know, it, it's a lot of fun. I'm not gonna lie, you get to work with some pretty great uh, colleagues. Here is me working with uh, Mickey Mouse. And uh, the other great thing too, is you get to work with these therapy dogs. Um, so this is a picture of me many moons ago when I was a student at uh, Arnold Palmer's Hospital for Children. They would always bring these therapy dogs. And I always remarked by th this dog uh, here, Daisy, who, yeah, literally poses for <laughs> for the camera. So um, again, you know, this is a, I think a very underserved population in, in physical therapy. It's a complex population, but you know, they, they can definitely be served by our skills and our, our knowledge and expertise. And there really hasn't been a champion for that really since Linda Crane. And you know, there's, there's emerging efforts coming out from the Academy of, physical, uh, Academy of Cardiopulmonary Physical Therapy and Pediatric Physical Therapy. There is this new special interest group. So I'd recommend checking that out because again, this, this is a population that um, now, especially as surgical interventions have gotten better, like that they're, they're surviving longer. They have these unique and special needs. And I think we're positioned perfectly to help address those needs. So uh, that is our unit on pediatric cardiology. Thank you.